Hi, Martin Turner here. This week we focus on capital expenditure decisions. We look at three methods for evaluating capital investments. The payback period, net present value, and internal rate of return. First, we set the scene by asking what we think capital is and what factors we might consider when deciding to buy a new car or new house. Hi, Martin Turner here, and welcome to the Week 11 Lecture for Act 11059 Accounting, Learning and Online Communication. This week we're looking at capital expenditure decisions. And we'll be looking at three techniques that we're using in the assignment, payback period, net present value and internal rate of return. Then we'll have a look at the minute paper. But before we get on to looking at capital expenditure decisions, which is where we're investing money for long-term returns, what do you, th and it's our capital we're putting into the business, what do you think capital is? Hop on to Socrative and answer that question. What do you think, what do you think capital is? Now, Caitlin says, capital is the money that you have to start a business. Yeah, most businesses require you to put a bit of money in, don't they? Well, anyway, we typically, most businesses you need to put some money in. That is some resources. That could be all sorts of assets, but typically some cash as well. And Nita, capital is anything that can benefit to its owner. What do you mean by that, Anita? Um, maybe an asset like cash or machinery and then ended up will bring some income to the owner yeah so you think it's something that might bring some uh economic benefits to an owner over time yes that's right do you have any capital cash you have some cash <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you're sort of spending that as you go a bit aren't you but you yeah. might have a bit of cash that might that can give you benefits in the future anything else that you think of as capital maybe my vehicle your vehicle, yeah. yeah. You're not sure whether that's a liability or an asset sometimes because you have to keep But that's right, it's giving you benefits. What sort of benefits does your vehicle give you in the future? What sort of benefits? Uh, let, let's say delivery. If I'm a business owner in the future, it helps me to um, deliver my stocks in inventory. Yeah, that's true. If it was a delivery van, that's mm -hmm. like in, um, in uh, it could be coffee vans, couldn't it, for Coffee Supreme? Or if it's your own car, it can take you around to things. You know, that's a benefit, isn't it? You can get to the shops, you can get out to things, visit friends. Simran Cow, capital is cost. Leah, I always have, I also have always thought of capital as money, cash, 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 or it's a cost. Misty and Cairns, very good, Misty. You put in where you're from. Excellent. An asset you own with the purpose of making money. So it's sort of an asset or it's cash, which is a particular type of asset, or it's a cost. Caitlin, capital is the money you have to start a business and need to capital is anything that can benefit to its owner. Derek in Brisbane, capital is the amount of funds and assets held by a company or a person. Capital could be your human capital. You know, you might have developed some skills or, and uh, that you can, that are, that are marketable and useful. So, all sorts of uh, so capital could be a lot of different things but people are sort of thinking of it as being money or um, particularly money or some sort of asset that you can invest in a business to um, to get some benefit in the future so Anita said her vehicle is an asset so but when you decide to buy a new car or a new house, you know, some sort of major investment, what factors do you consider and why? So go to question two in Socrative. When you decide to buy a new car or a new house, what factors do you consider and why? <laughs> Cheryl and Bundaberg, cash or assets to pay expenses as capital. Caitlin Moore, I, not yet. I haven't started a business yet, but one day I will. And Mohammed in Pakistan, capital means an amount that investors invest in a business. It is not just needed when you start business. It could be in 
the middle of business, yeah. Ryman Healthcare is investing a lot in the business every year. Hundreds and like $500 million in investing in new developments. Yeah, so yes, the business is growing strongly. You'll be investing. So what do you decide? You're deciding to buy a new car or a new house. What factors do you consider and why? Leah, the resale value, whether it will appreciate or depreciate. Well, what about, a, so a car, Leah, will that appreciate or depreciate? Unfortunately, I believe cars depreciate. <laughs> uh, you don't own a car. Very wise. Yeah, they tend to go down in value. Obviously, some certain ones go up in value, particularly if they get a bit older and in good condition. Um but yeah, and what about a house? Does that tend to appreciate or depreciate? Um, a house is probably, overall, I would say houses appreciate. Um, sometimes if you might get a bad investment, it might depreciate depending on the market. But overall, they generally appreciate. Yeah, in the longer term, they can go down a little bit. Um, in some countries like the US, they can go down a lot. The market's going to up. In Australia, it tends to just go down a little bit. It goes down, but certain areas can go down a lot. If you're sort of a certain regional areas, they can go down sometimes quite a bit. But yeah, typically appreciate over time. Yeah. So so that would be one factor. Am I is this likely, am I likely to be able to sell it for more or less than I'm buying it for? When deciding to buy a house, I would, Caitlin, I would consider the location. So the location of a property and the amount of water the area has, because I want to live on a property. Ah, so this is this is out of the city. When deciding to buy, so you're looking at the location. Location is an important thing, both in terms of resale, but also in terms of consumption, what you want to get out of it. And the amount of water the area has, that's not so much of a problem with a few areas at the moment. When deciding to buy a new car, I would consider price and how much fuel it goes through. Yes, yeah, so quite a lot of people are thinking about the fuel consumption because um, you know, that could be quite an expense. Also price at the resale value. Derek in Brisbane, the amount of money you've allocated towards this purchase. Yeah, so <laughs> that's the price, isn't it? How much money you've got. Funds required for this purchase vary and influence decisions to purchase. Rate required for a payment of purchase. Yeah, so if you're gearing up, how you're funding it. So you might be funding at the purchase with some borrowings as well as some of your own money perhaps. So you've got to be able to service that debt. So that's partly, so the financing is also an issue to consider, Derek's, for Derek. Misty, Cairns, how much the upkeep will be? Yeah, so you've got to have ongoing costs, interest rates, location, resale price. Yeah, so if it's a house, how much are you going to cost to upkeep? And, you know, you've got rates and other things to pay. You're going to have to pay interest. That may, may change over time, the interest rates location, resale price. So there's some things people are thinking of. And Nita, if I, one, if I have enough capital, such as cash to purchase, here's yeah, so can, can I actually, have I got the resources? And two, opportunity costs, potential benefit, if it is the best option to give up others. Now there's a good one. The opportunity costs, because if you, you can, your capital can only be invested on one trip at a time. If I buy an apartment in Yapoon, I can't, put that money into Ryman shares. <laughs> you can't do two things. The money can only do one thing at a time. And uh, so there's an opportunity cost. And that's often the biggest cost of anything that we do with our capital. And how much I need them. Yeah, so how much do I need a car? How much do I need somewhere to live? So there's some of the factors people consider with buying a house or a car. So we're going to be looking at capital investment decisions for businesses where they're investing for the longer term. And so capital budgeting, what is it? It's an analysis of the potential capital projects. So a business can be looking to see what uh, capital projects could it potentially invest in. So these are long-term decisions. It's like Ryman Healthcare, it could build some new retirement villages. So it's got potential capital projects. It, they're typically large expenditures, a bit like a house or a car, and typically large expenses, expenditures for most people. 
And these capital decisions are difficult or impossible to reverse. So that could be expensive. You buy a house, it's expensive to undo it, sell it again. There's lots of transaction costs and hassle. Same with a car. It can be expensive if you buy it to then suddenly change your mind. So it could be difficult, impossible to reverse. So there's sort of ones where you've got a degree of commitment and related to a firm's strategic direction. So Ryman Healthcare, its strategy is to develop and own and manage retirement village units in New Zealand and in Victoria, around Melbourne. That's its strategy. So its capital investment decisions are related to that strategy, that strategic direction. So these are some aspects of capital budgeting and capital investment decisions. Now, when we're making decisions, some people mentioned about the future cash flows. So there can be some expenses with a car. There could be the cash flows from its resale value. Um, there could be some cash flows relating to buying a house and keeping it up and so forth. So when we're making decisions on capital investment decisions, we're looking at cash flows out into the future, just as we are with a car or a house that we might buy. So some of the questions to think about are all the cash flows considered. And when we're looking at the cash flows, are they risk adjusted? We'll be looking at that. Or are we just putting the cash in? If we're looking at thinking about buying a car, we'll just sort of think about the cash. But is it risk adjusted? Can we rank projects? So if we're looking at numbers of options, can we rank them? So we might be looking at multiple cars or houses in a personal level or in Roman healthcare, it's looking at numbers of options it's got to develop new retirement villages. Can we rank the projects? Does the approach we use indicate added value to the firm? The reason Roman healthcare is investing in new retirement villages is to add value to its equity investors. Obviously, it's also looking to support its customers and the community and so forth. It has other stakeholders, but it needs to be adding value to the firm. Otherwise, it shouldn't be building the new retirement villages. And does it relate to the firm's strategic direction? Now, in assignment two, we're looking at three capital investment decision methods or, or ways of supporting those decisions payback period, net present value, and internal rate of return. Now, the payback period. The payback period is when we receive cash equal to the initial investment. Once we've received cash, this is actual cash, once we've received cash back from that in investment equal to what we initially put in, we can't lose our initial investment. If we've put in a million dollars into uh, uh, a retirement village development or some sort of capital investment within that, once that investment has returned a million dollars in cash back to me as the investor, then I can't lose my initial investment. I've got it back. So the payback period is how long will it take till we recover the initial investment? So it's a measure of risk. We're seeing, can we lose money in this investment? Well, once we've got the money back, we can't. So how do I calculate it? Well, we estimate the cash flows each period. So this is cash flows. We subtract the cash flows from the initial cost until they equal the initial cost. And we can calculate to the day, month or year when the cash flows will equal the initial investment. So it's a break even type of measure. When do we break even on the capital investment? And the decision rule with the payback period is accept the investment choice if the payback period is less than a preset limit. So we might say, look, we don't want to be investing in investments that take 10 years to get their money back or eight years. We want to get money back in five. So if we can't get the cash back in five years, it's too risky for us. And uh, so that we might have that. So that's a judgment about what that preset limit is. So how do we calculate it? 
how do we calculate how long it takes to recover the initial investment? Now, some investments might give the same cash flows each year. That's what we might forecast. We might say it just gives going to give us a million dollars a year in cash year after year, a constant amount. Now, if they're the same cash flows each year, then we can simply, it's a perpetuity, it's just going to give us that cash flow. So we can, initial investment divided by the investment return will give us the payback period. So if we invest $5,000 and it's going to return us $200 each year, same amount each year, then it would take us 25 years to get our 5,000 back. That's 5,000 divided by 200 equals 25 years. If we invest $5,000 and it returns us $2,000 per year, then it's $5,000 divided by 2,000, which equals 2.5 years. So in one, we get the money, we, we expect to get the cash back in two and a half years, the other is 25 years. So if we have years zero to year six, and these are cash flows, and these are not equal every year, and that's quite common, obviously, with a lot of investments. So we can calculate the cumulative cash flow. So in this example, year zero, the cash flow is negative 100,000. That's our initial investment. So we're investing $100,000 in this capital project. And what we expect in years one to three, we expect to get $15,000 each year. And then in years four to six, we expect to get $30,000 cash each year. So we can calculate the cumulative cash flow. In year zero, which is today, our cumulative cash flow is negative 100,000. We paid out $100,000 to invest. After one year, we get 15, we expect to get $15,000 back. So our cumulative cash flow is $100,000 minus $15,000, which equals negative $85,000. And then in year two, it's $70,000, the cumulative cash flow, which is $85,000 minus $15,000. And then in year three, it's $55,000, cumulative cash flow, which is $70,000 minus $15,000. So say after year three, we're expecting our cumulative cash flow to be negative fifty-five. Because we put in one hundred thousand, we've got forty five thousand back over three years. Next year it's thirty thousand. We expect to get so that reduces the cumulative cash flow to minus twenty five thousand. Then in year five we expect to get thirty thousand. So we expect to have positive cumulative cash flow of five thousand after year five, and then positive thirty five thousand dollar cumulative cash flow in year six. So where the cash flows are not the same each year, we can calculate the cumulative cash flow each year. And that's in this example. So in year five, we've got all our money back. We've got the 100,000 back during that year because we've got 5,000 positive at the end of the year. All the other years are still negative. So it's in year five. We know it's in year five. It's before the end of year five. So it's year four plus a bit. But where exactly do we expect to get the payback period? Now, so where there are part years, so, you know, we've got somewhere after year four, but before the end of year five, we can divide the cash flow needed to break even by the total cash flow for that final period. So you can see we need $25,000 at the end of year four to break even. We're expecting to get 30,000 cash flow um, in that period. So if we divide 25 by 30,000, times it by 365, we'll get 304 days. So we could say the break-even period is four years and 304 days. Or we could calculate 25,000 divided by 30,000 times 12, which equals 9.99 months. So it's four years and 10 months is the payback period. Or we could do 25,000 divided by 30,000 for years, so it's just that calculation. And so it's 0.83 years. So it's 4.83 years. So four years plus 0.83. So we can express it in days, four years and, and uh, 304 days, or four years and 10 months, or 4.83 years. So that's how we can calculate the payback period. 
So once we've calculated the payback period, do we accept or reject the project? 4.83 years payback period, do we accept or reject it? Well, that depends on what our predetermined limit is. If we said we've got to get our money back in four years, then no, that's, no we don't get our money back in four years, so we're not doing it. But if we said we, if we get our money back in five years or six years, then we would. So do we accept or reject the project depends on that, our, our predetermined limit. Now, the advantages of the payback period is it's easy to understand. <laughs> when do we get our cash back? It's, so it's, it's, it's simple and easy to understand, and it's biased towards liquidity. Let's get our cash back. We know it's much less risky. We got, there's no downside once we've got our cash back. The disadvantages is it ignores the time value of money. The time value of money is the idea that money today is worth more to us than money in the future. And that's primarily because these cash flows in the future are uncertain. So we, we happily put all these cash flows in our forecast, but we don't know whether we're going to get that money or not exactly. In fact, it's probably we'll get something different. That's our, just our best estimate. They're risky, whereas cash today in my pocket today, I've got it. It's not risky. I've, if I've got $100,000 in my pocket today, I know I've got it, but if you promise to give me $100,000 in three years' time, well, it's just a promise. I'm not sure what it'll be. It might be more, might be less. So we discount future cash flows to the present day to take into account that risk. Also, inflation and the opportunity to perhaps put in the bank and stuff too can play a part in that. But primarily, it's about risk. The other disadvantage of the payback period is you just have this arbitrary cutoff date, you know, five years, four years, three years, six years, where does that come from? So that's just a judgment and different people might, and, and just a sort of an assessment of your appetite for risk in terms of having to wait to get your money back. And also, and most importantly, it ignores the cash flows beyond the cutoff date. So if we've got a payback period of 4.83 years, and another option has a payback period of four years, and another one has a payback period of six years, and so we decide to go for the one with the shortest payback period of four years, say, well, what about the cash flows that are forecast beyond the payback period? The one that might pay you back the money in six years might have a huge amount of cash flow expected in years seven, eight, nine, and 10 compared to the other options, but you don't consider that when you're looking at payback period. So there are advantages and disadvantages with whatever approach you use, and there's some of the advantages and disadvantages of the payback period. So when using it, it is also important to just keep a little bit of an eye on what you think the cash flows might be after the payback period. Now, another approach you'll be using is the net present value. Net present value, it equals the present value of future cash flows. So we thought, just like with payback period, we're talking about future cash flows, but it's the present value of those future cash flows less the initial investment. So present value, we bring, we discount back those future cash flows to a value today. And of course, the initial investment is in today's dollars. The initial investment, that's $5,000. We expect cash flows of $200 per year for five years. Now we're gonna discount those future cash flows, $200 per year for five years, with a discount rate of 7%. So what that means is in year one, we expect to get $200. Discounting it back by 7% turns it into $187 today. The $200 in year two becomes discounted back to $175. $200 in year three becomes $163 today. $200 in year four becomes $153 today. $200 in year five becomes $143 today as we discount them back. We add up all those discounted cash flows and we get a present value of the future cash flows of $821 by adding up those five numbers. Now, to calculate the net present value, we take the present value of the future cash flows, which is $821. It's not five times $200 a thousand, it's $821 because we've discounted them back. To the present day, 
We take off the $5,000, which is the initial investment. And so we have a negative net present value of $4,179. So that's sort of the mechanics of how it's calculated. Now, the net present value calculates or looks at how much value is created from an investment and has these steps. Step one, you estimate the expected future cash flows. Step two, you estimate the required return for projects of this risk level. Now, the discount rate, the estimated required return for projects, can greatly affect your NPV. The higher the required return, the lower the NPV, net present value, and vice versa. And so you know, weighted average cost of capital can be used as a discount rate, but a lot of judgments involved in coming up with the required return. Step three, find the present value of the cash flows. That's what we did in the previous example. Find the present value of the cash flows and subtract the initial investment to arrive at the net present value. So that's the process. Step one, estimate the future cash flows. Well, here we are, I've estimated we're looking at a new project and we'll estimate these following cash flows. Negative 165,000 year zero, that's today, that's what the investment costs. That's what we're going to invest. Year one, 63,120. Year two, 70,800. Year three, 91,080. So we get these three cash flows coming at us in year one, two, and three. Then we estimate the required return for the project of, of this risk level. Um, for this example, we'll say our required rate of return for assets of this risk is 12%. Should we accept this project? Well, we calculate the net present value. And this is what Excel's doing. There's the scary formula. It's the, um, it's the cash flows in year T and where T equals zero through to year N. So we might have a three year period. So N might be three. It's, it's cash flows in year zero, year one, year two, year three, if n is three, and we add them all up. See that little, that, that uh, Greek symbol is, this is, represents sum. So we sum each of the, this calculation for each of those values for T. So we get the cash flows in year zero, year one, year two, year three, and we divide, say, the cash flow each year by one plus R or to the power T, where R is the discount rate. Now in assignment two, we use Excel to carry out the scary looking formula. You shouldn't be too worried about formulas and stuff like that. It, these are all actually pretty straightforward to figure out once you're used to them. But let's have a look at it manually. So we use Excel and you'll be doing that in the assignment. Let's just have a look at what Excel's doing behind the scenes. So we put in the uh, initial investment and then the cash flows each year. And so each year we calculate the discount. You can see that in year zero, it's divided by 1.12, 12% is the discount rate, 1.12 to the power of zero, which which just means that it'll be negative 165,000. The ne next one, it's the cash flow in year one, 63,120 divided by 1.12 to the power one, and so on to the power two, power three, and we get those numbers there. They all add up to $12,627.41. So that's how we can calculate it manually. That's what uh, Excel does for us. And, uh, so that's our net present value, 12,627. Now, the decision rule for net present value is to accept a project if the net present value is greater than zero. Net present value greater than zero means the project is expected to add value to the firm, that is to increase the wealth of owners. Now, the net present value considers all the cash flows. We can project out the cash flows to the end, and discount the back payback period just looks at the cash flows up to the payback period until we get our money back. It also adjusts for risk in terms of the calculation of the time value of money. So we put in the risk element into those cash flows. The cash flows are uncertain. There's some risk around them, and so we discount them back. 
the time value of money, we, it ranks mutually exclusive projects. So Ryman Healthcare might be able to build one sort of retirement village on a piece of land or a different sort of retirement village on the same piece of land. So they're mutually exclusive projects. You can't do both. You're going to have to do project A or project B because you're going to do them all on the same piece of land. So some projects are mutually exclusive and this ranks them. So you just, I've got to decide which one to use. So this is a method that can help you do that. And it's directly related to the increase in wealth of the investors. Now, also in assignment two, we look at internal rate of return. Now, the internal rate of return is the rate of return when NPV equals zero. So what will be the rate of return when it's just, it's like a break even, NPV equals zero. So we saw this example where all those cash flows for five years. NPV will equal zero when the present value of those future cash flows, $200 a year for five years, equals $5,000, the same amount as the initial investment. So the Excel can calculate that for us. It does it iteratively, just tries different number, different discount rates until it gets to one that provides NPV equals zero. And in these numbers, that's the internal rate of return is minus 37%. That uh, internal rate of return, the net present value is zero. So the internal rate of return of this particular investment was minus 37%. <laughs> Now, to manually calculate internal rate of return, we use trial and error. We keep calculating using the scary NPV formula and change the rate of return each time until NPV equals zero. So in that scary formula, we just keep changing the R and, and recalculate it, you know, T equals zero, T equals one, T equals two, T equals three, so on, add them all together, get the answer. And then we keep doing it with different R's until NPV equals zero. And that's actually what uh, Excel is doing behind the scenes. So in the internal rate of return function in Excel, we include the initial investment in the cash flows. We accept a project if the IRR is greater than the required return. So IRR equals minus 37% is less than the 12% required return. So we won't make this investment. So IRR has certain advantages and disadvantages. Its advantages is it's often pre preferred by executives because it's intuitively appealing. We understand what an IRR of 10% or 15% or 20% or minus 37% means. We understand that sort of return idea. And it's easy to communicate value of a project. It also considers all the cash flows and considers the time value of money. You know, we're discounting back to the present day. The disadvantages is that in certain circumstances it can produce multiple answers. Basically, if you have an investment that's going to have a number of cash flows out, it, like we're looking at an example where you just invest once, the beginning and then you get the positive cash flows out, that's fine. But if you have an investment where well, I'm going to put a million dollars in this year, and then in year three, it's going to require another million dollars and so on, then it can produce multiple answers. And we cannot rank mutually exclusive projects. So you just get your internal rate of return. But the, um, uh, the, uh, it, it, it doesn't allow us to um, rank them if they're mutually exclusive. I'll explain that a little bit more. Mutually exclusive projects is where we, if we accept one project, it precludes accepting another project. So for example, we might have a required rate of return of 10%. We have project A and project B. One requires us to invest $500,000 and the other $400,000. And then there's cash flows of 325,000 in year one and two in project A and 325,000 and $200,000 in year two for project B. The internal rate of return of project A is 19.4% and the internal rate of return on project B is 22.2%. But the NPV and the NPV for project A is 64.1% and the NPV for project B is 
or oh, dollars, I should say, that should be percentages. So which do I pick? Which project should you accept and why? Well, the, the NPV looks at the comparison of the different sizes. And so project A, because you invest a bit more money, it might return a little bit less internal rate of return, but provides higher value add. So payback summary. The payback period is the length of time until the initial investment is recovered in cash. We accept if the payback period is less than some specific, specified target. It doesn't account for the time value of money, that you know, there's more uncertainty as the cash flow goes out further into the future. And it ignores the cash flows after the payback period. And the cutoff period is basically arbitrary, just a judgment. The net present value is the difference between the present value of cash flows and the initial investment. And we accept if net present value is greater than zero. Now, when we use um, Excel, it calculates the present value of the future cash flows. We don't include the initial investment. So you get the present, the present value of the future cash flows, and then you've got to take off the initial investment separately to get to the net present value. And we accept net present value. We accept uh, investments if the net present value is greater than zero. Now, the internal rate of return is the discount rate that makes net present value equal zero. And we accept if the internal rate of return is greater than the required return. So we might say we require 15%, and so we calculate the IRR, and if it's greater than 15%, we accept. Now, there can be difficulties with non-conventional cash flows with internal rate of return, which basically means you, you're investing money a number of times rather than just once at the beginning. And uh, there can be difficulties with mutually exclusive projects and choosing between the two, because some projects might have quite a small amount that you invest in, others might have quite a lot, and so the one that invests and they're mutually exclusive, you can't do both of them. They would say using the same piece of land. But some, so a project might have a higher internal rate of return, but involve much less investment. And so it's an adding the same sort of value that one with a slightly high, lower internal rate of return might be adding a lot more value because it involves a bigger investment. So what was the most important thing you learned today? And what questions remain unanswered. What was the most important thing you learned today? Well, Derek in Brisbane will wait for others' answers, but Derek has said capital can include human capital. Individual skills gain can be claimed as capital. Well, that's right. If capital is something, you know, these expend, capital expenditure decisions, you know, investing in capital, that's something we expect a payoff in the future. So you might be in learning things, work or studying, and you're expecting that that's going to give you some benefits in the future. So, it's, so that can be quite a big part of our personal capital. Anita, payback period, the length of time until we receive our initial investment. Net present value, present value of future internal, present value of future cash flows. Internal rate of return, discount rate that makes NPV equal zero. Those are the factors we should consider before accepting a project or involvement in an investment. So we've just introduced you to these three methods, payback period, net present value, and internal rate of return. These are examples of methods that can be used and the accounting systems, the accounts, and the accountants can come up with the future cash flow estimates. It might be based on what's happened in the past and some other judgments. So our finance people, internal finance people come up with the cash flows. And these are some techniques that can be used to assess different projects, to assist management to decide whether they'll invest or not. So what was the most important thing you learned today? So for Anita, it was those three methods. That's what we've looked at. We're just introducing them. There's lots of technical detail to them, not so much the payback period, but to net present value and turn rate of return. But we can, and you'll get some experience of using the Excel financial functions, just to see that there's a lot of functions, like a lot of financial functions in Excel that we can use, and they just make it all doable to calculate all these things easily. So you get a little bit of practice with that and, and learn a few of the tips. So what was the most important thing you learned today? What questions still remain unanswered? Derek, the time value of money is an important concept to understand. It is, and a lot of people struggle with it. 
a lot of people struggle with this idea of the time value of money. And I noticed that in the step six. I don't have any cash with me. I don't have any cash. I don't carry cash around so much. <laughs> but here's a credit card. Say that was money, you know. That's got $100 on it. Would you? Who would like this $100? Here it is right now. Who would like it? You can call out or you can put it on to chat. Who would like $100? Say this card has $100 on it. Would you like it? Who would like it? Show me the money. Oh, Derek, you're the first one. You would like $100. All right. Derek, well, there you go, Derek. What about, what about if I gave you $200 in a year's time? Would you prefer the $100 now or $200 in a year's time? I'll take the $200 in a year's time. Take the $200 in a year's time. Who else would, who else, um, would like $100 now or $200? Who else would like the $200 in a year's time or who would like $100 now? Holly, what, do you, what would you prefer, $100 now or $200 in a year's time? Or Muhammad, what would you prefer? $100 now. You take $100 now. Derek wants the $200. Why do you want the $100 now? If I get $100 now, I can invest in any business so I can get it profit every year or every month. So I prefer $100 now. Because so, you could invest it in a business and you reckon you could double yeah. your money in an investment? Yeah. You can, easy. You can just do that, can you? Yeah. What about, if I, what about $300 in a year's time? What would you prefer, $100 now or $300 in a year's time? $100 now. Yes. What about $1,000 in a year's time? $1,000. Um, my $300 now. You still want $100? <laughs> yeah. What about what about $500,000 in a year's time and $100 now? What would you prefer? No, I can. <laughs> it's difficult, but um, my bag can go with the uh, $500,000. Yep. You go for the 500000 <laughs> yeah. So I broke you. You'll get that in a year's time. <laughs> Derek was happy with $200. But I took $500,000 to, to, instead of the $100 in a year's time. Is that right? So go for it. What about Hester? What would you prefer, $100 now or $200 in a year's time? Oh, here we go. Oh, Tuffy, I'd take the chance on the 500000 in a year's time. That was Jess. She's worried that I may not have $200 in a year's time. The higher you increase the amount in a year's time, the acceptance rate will be higher. You want $100 now, Hester. What about $300 in a year's time? Would you prefer $100 now or $300 in a year's time? You can just comment on chat. What would you prefer? What about Holly? You can comment on chat or just call out. $100 now or Joseph, what would you prefer? $100 now or $300 in a year's time? You'd like the three hundred dollars. You'd take the three hundred. Hester, what about you? You want the hundred dollars now, or or three hundred dollars in a year's time? Well, some people, some people, you. Hundred dollar now. Sorry, Hester. Yep. Yeah. Or who was that? Esther wants $100 now because she does not know what will happen later in the year, in a year's time. All right. So some people have taken $100. Some people have taken $300. Some people have taken $200. And Muhammad has taken, it took, I took $50,000 or something, some huge amount of money only taking that. Well, today is, the, today is the 25th of May. Next year, 25th of May, same time. 10 a.m. You you dial up, dial up on the Zoom, ready to get your money. Some are getting 200, some are getting 300. Hester's stuck to her 100. She got that. She's got today 100. So she's not turning up. And some people, 50,000 or whatever it is, whatever it was I said. Yeah, 500,000. <laughs> Did I say 500,000? So Muhammad's up for his 500, people are up for 300. So you're zooming in to get your money. So you zoom in and there's no Martin. 
I'm not here. And it's just an empty room. And you go, well, where's Martin? So you ring me up. You ring me up. You say, you ring up Martin. Hey, me, 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 me. Ring me up. And I answer the phone and I say, oh, Martin Turner here. And, and um, Mohammed says, it's Mohammed here. I'm up for my 500,000. Joseph here. I'm up for my 300. And I go, oh, what are you talking about? What do you mean? They said, you promised us you'd case $300, $300 a year's time or five hundred. I said, oh, I can't remember doing that. What do you mean? I'm, I'm here in the Bahamas at the moment. I'm just sunning myself. But anyway, nice to talk with you. Goodbye. So if that happens, Hester has taken the $100 and you had the promise of $300 or $200 or $500,000, but it didn't work out. So who's the happy person? Oh, Jess wants $100 now, please. Well, the reason money is worth more today to most people, like $100 today is worth more than $100 promised in the future, is because it's risky. It's risky. It may, it may happen, it may not. And in, in investments, it might be more, might be less. We like it to be, we like the certainty of the $100. Now, Hester particularly liked the certainty of the money. She didn't want all this promise business because maybe Martin won't turn up with the money. But if I've got it now, I've got it in my hot hands. That is the time value of money. The idea that most people prefer the certainty of cash today to uncertain amounts in the future. When we're looking at the payback period, the net present value, the internal rate of return, we're forecasting future cash flows. They are not certain. They're not certain. So They're at risky. So They're not certain. They're risky. So that's why we discount future cash flows back to the present day. That's the main reason why we value money today more than in the future, because we like the certainty. And, but some people like the certainty more than others. Some people are happier to take a risk than others. For Mohammed, I had to offer him 500000 before he risked his 100 bucks today, whereas Derek, he was happy at 200 and others at 300 so people have a different appetite for risk. And, but most people prefer the certainty of dollars today. So that's why that's the time value of money. It's an important concept when we're thinking about capital investment decisions because the expected payoffs in the future are years out and there's risk. The risk increases as the time goes by. In PV, net present value is estimates is, is a way to judge whether an investment is worth considering. Selecting the project to invest in can be a difficult decision, but it's assisted by an understanding of future cash flows. So that's right. The payback period, the net cap, present value and internal rate of return had the benefit of just giving us some discipline in forecasting what we expect the cash flows to be. And we can forecast them in a range. We can say, oh, we think this might be most likely, but there's some prospect the cash flows might be at this level, you know, high level, and some risks they might be at a lower level, and we can do a few sensitivities on our net present value, internal rate of return and payback period to get a bit of a feeling for risk. So what have we looked at today? We've looked at capital expenditure decisions. These are decisions where we invest money today with expectation of benefits years into the future. Just as if we're buying a car or a house, the benefits are for uh, longer term, they're not just immediate. And so we looked at the payback period, the net present value and the internal rate of return, the three methods. You'll have the opportunity to apply them in uh, assignment two and just get a little bit of familiarity with them. So we're introducing those concepts to you today. And you can see how accounting can help us generate these future cash flows. We can look at the past accounts, we can um, make some judgments about what might be happening in different elements of the business or other reasons. So Ryman Healthcare in 
in coming up with his expected future cash flows or a future investment in a new retirement village will draw on its experience of building previous retirement villages and it will make adjustments for changes and different situations but it, you get better at making these forecasts if you've got some experience and these are accounting to these are tools that can help us use the accounting figures and make some judgments about um, looking at the benefits and the costs of these sorts of decisions just as we do when we're looking at our own personal capital investment decisions for a car. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, look forward to working with you as we go through the next week and, uh, uh, and bye for now, bye-bye.